Welcome to our weekly show for the National Association of Independent Medical Practices. You can find us at naimp.org. NAIMP is an organization focused on helping independent medical practices become more successful by providing innovative discussions, networking with like-minded professionals, and opportunities for growth, education, and increased revenue. Check out our website today at naimp.org. Hello and welcome. This is Shirley Cress Dudley, your host, and today it's a pleasure to have back with us Beth Boyton. Beth is a nurse consultant specializing in communication and collaboration. She has recently completed her second book coming out this spring called Successful Nurse Communication, Safe Care, Healthy Workplaces, and Rewarding Careers. Beth writes about related issues at her blog, Confident Voices in Healthcare, and has a video, Interruption Awareness, a nursing minute for patient safety, that has drawn audiences all over the world. Beth's excited about using theater improv activities to help teach these skills in an effort to make healthcare safer and more rewarding to work in. She's trained in the Professor Watson Curriculum for Medical Improv through Northwest University Feinberg School of Medicine. She has one grown son who works in India, loves improv, Zumba dancing, walking and swimming, and comes to us today from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And our topic for today is status activities from, for medical improv. And Beth, I have one question before you start. Has your book come out since the last time you spoke at NAIMP? Oh, thanks, Shirley. It's coming out September 4th, so I'm very excited about that. Great. Super. Um, then I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, we're looking forward to the book uh, and now status activities from Medical Improv. Thanks so much, Shirley. It's really exciting to be back with you. And I have been teaching communication and collaboration for about a decade now, and I believe that medical improv has so much promise for us in learning some complicated skills that underlie communication and collaboration. So today, um, what we're going to do is explore uh, status, high and low status, and how that impacts a lot of our behaviors and a lot of our relationships. And so let me just start by going over these objectives. Uh, we will increase our ability to identify verbal and nonverbal indicators of high and low status. We'll recognize effective uses of status in therapeutic and in interpersonal professional relationships. We'll demonstrate ability to portray high or low status to promote positive individual and organizational behaviors. So let's start with, I'm going to tell you a little bit about medical improv and a, a, one of the major principles in a minute. Um, the podcast that I did with you, Shirley, last winter goes into more depth about the principles and their application to healthcare. So if listeners are interested in going further down that path, I think that will be a helpful thing to listen to. Mm -hmm. um, but let me give you a definition of medical improv. And this definition is uh, written by Dr. Belinda Fu, MD, and it was written following a brainstorming session that I was fortunate to participate in in June of 2012 when the very first Train the Trainer program was led by Professor Katie Watson. And she teaches medical improv and has for quite a few years at Northwestern University School of Medicine. So this is the definition of medical improv that we came up with. It is the study and the practice of improv theater philosophy and techniques as they're applied to the unique uh, challenges and environment of healthcare for the benefit of improved health and well-being of providers and patients. And I really like this definition because it's so inclusive. It includes the high stress, high stakes aspects of the work that we work in and it includes the health and well-being of patients as well as the people 
those of us that are working really hard sometimes to provide the care. So um, I guess I'll just mention briefly that some of the terms out there, you might hear improv versus applied improv versus medical improv. And just so that you know the differences, um, we're using the theater techniques and philosophies um, applied specifically to the medical world. So the principles that you would see in a regular improv class or an applied improv class that was dedicated towards um, uh, leadership or team building across the spectrum of leadership and team building, it's different in, in the medical setting because we can bring home points to um, patient safety, uh, medical errors, uh, patient experience, uh, as well as morale and job satisfaction. So we can really tailor the activities in ways that help us in specific uh, ways. We can even uh, be doing a workshop for our local library here in Portsmouth in August, and I'm going to gear that a little bit more towards consumers to help them um, speak up with uh, their health care providers. So there's those differences. But um, let me elaborate a little bit on this golden rule of improv, that yes and. And you would find this in any description of improv, whether you were looking at it applied or theater improv or medical improv. And basically what that is, is it's saying that in whatever activity you're participating in, that you will agree to honor what the other person is bringing forward and validate it, and then um, bring something more to the situation. So this is not a, a small principle because really it puts us all in positions where we all have to be willing to be in the moment with somebody else as well as to listen to what they're saying, not what we think they should say or get ready for what, they, what we think they might say, but what exactly are they saying and to validate it. And then the, the and part um, takes it even further, it helps nudge us to be creative in the moment. And I think just in a general way, we can think about that in healthcare is this, just this, the spontaneity that we need to be doing our, bringing our very best forward in every situation. And it's not, it can't be scripted. So this kind of activity helps us to stay present and um, collaborate for best outcomes. And I'm going to give you an example of how I would teach that um, activity, that principle of improv, by having people break down into pairs. And I would tell them that we're going to have three conversations. And the first conversation is going to be using this yes and principle. And then we would compare it to conversations where instead of saying yes and, we say yes but. Or the third one is that we say no. And in the debriefing, which is very important in terms of teaching this material, with debriefing, we can start to focus on what, what did it feel like when you said yes and, or what did it feel like when it was yes but. And so just to give you a quick example, um, I might say, all right, have a, have a conversation about going uh, to a trip to Hawaii. And with the yes and principle being followed, I might say something like, well, I'm going to get my suitcase out and start packing for our trip to Hawaii. My partner might say, yes, and I'll call a cab to bring us to the dock. And I might say, oh, that reminds me, I better get my seasickness pills. So in that situation, my partner and I are building something together. And I might have started out thinking I was flying to Hawaii, but when my partner mentions the dock, all of a sudden, we're on a we're going to be on a boat, and that so we're both participating in creating the story. If if I put the same um, two people with a conversation using yes, but it flows out a little differently. I might start the same way and say, "I'm going to get my suitcase out and start packing for our trip to Hawaii." My partner might say, "Yes, but that that suitcase case is old and smelly." You can see how the quality of that conversation shifts. It's, it's not as validating. It's not as collaborative. Um, we could still go to Hawaii in that conversation, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be quite as much um, 
fun to go together. And then that take it. <clears throat> the third conversation would be to uh, say no to the other person. And in improv, we call that blocking. And so it might start out something like, oh, I'll use the same example. I'm going to get my suitcase out and start packing for a trip to Hawaii. And my partner might say something like, no, I canceled our, our flight. And you can see how quickly the tone of that conversation and the potential to go somewhere just ends. It falls flat. Where else can we go? We're not going to go to Hawaii anymore. So doing that activity uh, in, a, in a classroom or meeting conference room with staff helps them to see how um, their approach to another person's statement might make a difference in the quality of where the statement can go. So that's, that's like the main rule of improv. Um, there are literally hundreds of games and activities and very major, profound learning that can take place. Some of those learnings um, would be we, you can build trust, um, as I've already mentioned, listening and assertiveness. It can help manage stress. The video that you mentioned in the introduction about interruptions is a great example of using an activity called overload to raise awareness about our limitations, about when we're feeling overwhelmed. And um, it also helps to, to teach concentration. Um, we can learn leadership and followership. And in reality, I think that we're all, we, all, we all have to be good at both of those. I think physicians, chiropractors, dentists need to be in charge more often than not. And nurses may be sort of in the middle where, where we're following um, physicians much of the time, but we're also leading some of the other staff. So we have to be able to do both and vacillate in between both of those. So, um, and it can really make a huge difference in terms of collaborative leadership when um, leaders are able to be authoritative when they need to be, but also be step back and gather consensus and input from others um, when that can be helpful too. So all these things can happen in improv activities. We can um, additionally gain a sense of empathy. We can become better at critical thinking and situational awareness. We can also grow in our own awareness of self, self as well as um, social cues. Those are some of the things that we can learn. And um, as today's focus is going to be on status. So now we'll take our medical learning plat, um, excuse me, medical improv platform and look at what we can do by focusing on status. So this is a quote from Keith Johnstone, who wrote the book Impro. It's like improv without the V, if you're only listening. It's a very famous book in um, the acting world. And there are two chapters in that book that are absolutely fascinating about how human beings use high and low status. But this quote, he, he says, once you understand that every sound and posture implies a status, then you perceive the world quite differently. And this change is probably permanent. And um, it's interesting. I suspect that as you listen to this uh, podcast and go on about your day after, you will start to notice more and more about uh, how status plays a role in your various relationships. So let's look at um, what high status looks like. Um, I'm going to read this list and then I'll give you a little bit of an example. On um, high status, typically we take up more personal space. Our body posture, you can probably imagine, we are standing straight, our chest is expanded. Um, when we're talking, we're clear and confident, use less words, keep our head still, and we're not fidgeting, we're not apologizing. In fact, we can maintain confidence even if we're not making any sense. For instance, I might say, well, the balloons did fall into the river, but the canoes were there. And that's like making this kind of a 
ridiculous. I don't know what I was talking about, balloons and canoes, but I said it with an air of confidence. Um, we can seek out eye contact. Uh, may be different depending on um, culture, cultural norms. So that's uh, in general. Um, we are relaxed and in charge, maybe even bored. Um, our facial expressions are, show confidence or perhaps impatience, impatience depending on um, who we're, we're talking with. I like to tell the story about uh, Dr. Salerno, who is an emergency room physician. And he and I were having a conversation once, and he told me how he greets his patients. And he says, this is what he does. He says, hi, I'm Dr. Salerno. He reaches out and shakes their hand. He says, but please call me Tony. And I think in that brief sentence, there's a huge gift of, first of all, he's saying, I'm Dr. Salerno, so he's saying, I'm in charge. From a clinical standpoint, I have high status, and I know that you're here to see me as a doctor, and that's the role that I'm playing in this relationship. It's a very important place to show high status. But he's also saying, but please call me Tony while he shakes their hand. And I think in that moment, he's saying, I'm a human being. I care about you. Um, and, and that's why I'm here to, to help. I'm with you. And that shift is, is it's sort of a lower status. It's not low status, but it's a lower status that we're, we're in a mutual place as human beings. And I just think it's a, it's a brilliant um, way to demonstrate his leadership. And in, so my guess is that that patient is going to trust and feel safe with, with him um, during their time together. So I think that, that that's a good example of using awareness of, of status in a healthy therapeutic way. So let's just look at low status. Low status is speaking softly, muttering, using a lot of words, unnecessary words, and I'm sure many physicians can attest to <laughs> nurses going on and on about some simple point, and they were like, will you please get to the point? And uh, as a nurse, I've certainly done that. I've dabbled on when I really want to say one thing. Um, so this is what the blood pressure is. But um, as I'm feeling in a lower status, that might be one of the things that I'm doing. And one of the ways to teach somebody to... Um, demonstrate to use less words and save time would be to have this kind of a, a, a an opportunity to become aware of when they're feeling low status and to try to become put themselves in a higher status position so they're not using quite so many words um, people in low status tend to be fidgety they're apologizing even when they didn't do anything they may cover their mouth when speaking or touch their face. It's almost like I wonder if in a low status position we might feel like we're invisible and we have to actually check to see that we actually are still here <laughs> or mm -hmm. to cover our mouth because maybe what we have to say doesn't hold value. Um, we take up less personal space. We avoid eye contact. Um, we lack confidence even when we do make sense. And we may be worried and fearful um, in our facial expressions. So those are some examples of low status. Uh, to bring this into a clinical uh, story, I remember a time where my mother was in a nursing home, and she told me about this later, and I was just so grateful to the nurse who did this. Um, my mother was anxious and stressed out and frustrated, and in the middle of the night, the nurse went in and asked if she could sit next to her. and hold her hand and so she pulled up a chair and just for maybe five minutes sat with my mother and I think my mother at that point felt like this person cares about me I'm you know she's um, she's still the nurse so she's still in charge of, of a clinical situation but as a human being just like Dr. Solano um, in that moment she was next to her and with her not towering over her taking her blood pressure or something so that's an example of of a low status, using low status. I don't think the nurse was thinking, oh, I'm going to lower my status, or Dr. Solano was thinking, oh, I'm going to lower my status. I'm going to say I'm high status here and low status there. But um, they're great examples for how we can use status uh, therapeutically. So let's talk a little bit about how this awareness um, can help us with 
these really key issues, communication, relationships and collaboration, workplace culture, and leadership. And, you know, it's like if you have a chance to look at the underlying root causes of our, our mistakes that we make, the Sentinel event data that the Joint Commission publishes, much of that has to do with communication and leadership and human factors. And so from a standpoint of patient safety, it's extremely important that we're building positive relationships and building positive cultures and um, getting along together and bringing our best forth in all of the teamwork that we do. And it will vary. Our status will vary uh, with our relationships and with the roles that we're playing as well as the situations that we're in. So being able to do a dance of um, being in high versus low status can actually take place over the course of just a few minutes. Um, you know, we can use a high status to communicate clearly and effectively and efficiently. We can use a little lower status to demonstrate compassion or listen to a colleague or a staff member or if a patient seems nervous like my mother was. We can use high status to speak up in a team meeting or use lower status to help create psychological safety so that others might speak up. We can contribute to positive workplace cultures by using status to show respect for ourselves and for others literally all the time and how we're approaching things. We can appreciate the differences of, of being in charge or being intimidating. And I think that's an important um, issue because I think when we use high status to be helpful like Dr. Solana did in that situation, we're using our expertise and our education and our knowledge um, as a way to help somebody. If we use that to um, diminish somebody else's value, I'm not saying that we do it consciously, but sometimes I do think that that, that happens out there. It's like that can be a hurtful way to use our status. And the opposite is true, too. I think sometimes um, if, I, if I'm speaking not confidently about something that I actually do know as a nurse, I diminish the value of what I'm saying, and if what I'm saying is valuable, it's important for me to bring that forward into the discussion, into the rounds, or how, however we're um, involved in a particular scenario. So it's just another way of looking at how important this understanding our, our own comfort levels with status and what we tend to do and, and having a, an intention about them that is compassionate and thoughtful um, we can appreciate our, how our body posture might affect others and our language and sensitivity to the status that others are projecting. You know, as leaders, if, if, if I'm a, a seasoned nurse in a work environment and um, there's a new nurse that's just graduated coming in, I can pretty much guarantee that that nurse is going to be anxious about um, her performance. and. That's okay. A little, some anxiety is a good thing. But I can also be careful to try to be reassuring and use my status as a seasoned nurse to be helpful and, and have some of that in charge um, status, but also not overdo it so that I'm using it in any kind of a way to be intimidating. Um, it can be tricky to have awareness of when to use which. Um, and I don't it's not like there's a black and white answer to that. I do believe that the more that we're aware of it for ourselves and for others, that we will use it most wisely. And that's another reason why these kinds of workshops and the activities that Shirley and I will do in a little bit can be helpful because they open up the door to having new awareness and conversations about uh, the best way that we can grow individually and as a team. So having said all that, Let's take it from the, the more intellectual discussion about what medical improv is with respect to status and bring it into some games and activities that will help uh, us discover our own personal comfort levels and also because they're fun. Does that sound okay? Because Shirley, you're going to help me with that, right? Yes, that sounds great. Okay. 
The first um, activity is one that I will describe, and it's basically a nonverbal. <laughs> I didn't really mention that. There are lots of nonverbal and verbal cues that you could see in those lists of high and low status. But this particular activity is nonverbal, and it can you can have pretty big groups do it, but it's nice to have maybe a dozen volunteers that um, respect that participate while the rest of the group watches because the audience or the other participants can help by noticing um, different different um, gestures and body postures and indications of status. So basically what this is, you take a deck of cards and you take out the kings and the tens and the twos. And if you have more people, you can take out the kings and the jacks and the nines and the fours and the two. The idea is that the higher the status, the higher the card, the higher the status. And so each person gets a card, but they don't look at the card. They put it up on their forehead, and they're instructed to mill about. And you could tell them that they're at a business meeting or a cocktail party, whatever you want to do. But they, are, they need to show what they think their status is and in response to the status that they see the other person has. And so it's quite remarkable to watch people, um, how they have their body posture when a two comes up against the, a, a king, because the king is going to demonstrate, um, they, they're going to think, well, that, that person's a two, so uh, um, they'll automatically take on higher posture, bo uh, excuse me, higher status po body postures. At, well, the two doesn't know that they're a two, but how will they respond to that That one that's looking like this, so have such greater status than they do, and so the, and the people are in the middle. It's a little bit more confusing. Uh, they are higher than some and lower than than others, and so it, it it creates a great opportunity for discussion after you do this activity for a few minutes. You can also uh, have a variation where you say, without looking at your cards, line up in the order of status that you think you are. And um, it's pretty interesting to see how people will fit in from high to low, uh, given their cards. So there's a lot going on. I think it helps bring a, a, a kind of a consciousness to stuff that's, that's going on in our relationships. So that's the uh, card status activity. And now we're going to do some um, one-upmanship womanship and a status slide. And Shirley has been very gracious to be willing to practice uh, dem a demonstration of these two, these three activities, all of which will be helpful again in having conversations and raising awareness. So, are you feeling ready to do this? Yes, I'm ready. Early, okay. Yes. Um, little instructions so folks listening and looking at the webinar can understand that what our goal is in this conversation is to. With one upmanship, we are going to each, we're going to use the yes and principle mentioned before, but we're going to raise our status to try to keep um, making it higher than the other person. So um, we are decided to do a couple of patients in the dentist's office. Yes. Does that sound okay, Shirley? Sounds okay. good. All right, so here is Shirley and Beth doing one-upmanship. Well, um, I really don't love coming to the dentist, but I have a presentation I want to get my teeth slightly whitened for. Oh, that's nice. You're getting your teeth whitened. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually getting veneers on that will cover my whole smile, and instead of just whitening them, it will make them extra bright. Wow, that sounds really impressive. You are going to have all of your teeth extra white with those veneers, and I bet you'll be gleaming. Um, if I decided to use my whole smile in a presentation that I'm doing, which is coming up next week for uh, a group of neurologists, then I think that I'll probably go ahead and make a separate appointment for doing that with the neurologist. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. That's 
sounds good. Um, the presentation that you're doing, isn't that the one that I'm the keynote of? You know, I think you are going to be the keynote speaker for that conference because we had a conversation back in September when I had to make a tough decision. Was I going to be the keynote and organize the conference and speak? And I just had to give up something. So I decided to stick with this, the, the topic of medical improv because it's so vital. Well, I do appreciate you being willing to organize the conference, um, especially since I started the conference 10 years ago. And so it does get a little old to have to um, organize it myself every year. So we do appreciate your participation and help. Mm, you've been doing a great job um, creating and running the conference for 10 years. And it's so exciting to see how it's going to be taken, taking on whole new level with the book that I wrote is coming out um, next week about the same topic, but obviously I've taken it a little bit further. Uh, um, okay, I'm stuck now, Beth. That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's okay. We, we, it's kind of fun to do. It's like you could say you that's the third book that's come out and you hope that it masters the bestseller that you had and then I could take it to having a movie being made. Mm, very it's good. just kind of a, a fun way. And keep in mind that you and I are doing this just with our language, uh, uh, you know, verbal exchange of information. People can't see that our we, we could be using our body posture to take up more space and um, slow down our, our conversation and use other high status tools. In fact, there are probably some improvisers out there that are much better than I am at it and would have some great coaching to offer us on how to demonstrate our high status. A any feedback about that, Shirley, that you'd like to share? Or Well, the one-upmanship just feels like a competition, a little bit of a, of a battle, um, a little bit frustrating. Mm. It is kind of like it, 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 it shows how status can intermingle with power, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I, I have more power than you. I'm better than you. I was laughing. I was at my Zumba class this morning, and the woman that was next to me was new, and I thought to myself, oh, I have high, higher status because I know the moves, and I just think in that awareness how ridiculous that is. You know, it doesn't make me a better person. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's funny to notice that. So let's try the one downmanship. Okay. Um, basically the same um, idea, but instead of raising our status, we're going to try and lower our status. Um, and I think that we decided to maybe be two nurses at the end of a shift in the doctor's office. Um, or was it doctor and or nurse and receptionist, maybe? Oh, yes, you're right. Nurse and receptionist. That's right. Yep. Okay. okay. So, um, Shirley, you're going to be the receptionist, and I'll be the nurse. Okay. Um, wow, that was a that was a tough day. You can't believe that Sally called in sick. I, really, it's it's hard for me to do her job and mine. Yes, you did have a have a long day doing the work of two people. Um, but gosh, we had two people out in the front office, so I all day long I've been doing the work of three people. It's just been crazy today. Oh, wow, that sounds like a really hard day trying to work, do the work of three people. You know, it reminds me of the the past like three days. Sally was out. The X-ray guy that was coming to show us the X-rays didn't show up, and then I got a call from the business manager that I had to give an in-service on radiology, and I was like. I really did. I didn't even know what I was supposed to talk about, let alone what to say. Wow, that sounds very frustrating. Uh, in fact, next week is going to be even more crazy for me. The entire front office is out, and I'll have to, to run the check-in, the check-out, answer the phone, and then with our new computer system, I'll have to run in the back and help you and the other guys with the computer system. It's just going to be wild next week. Oh, Shirley, I just don't know how we're going to get through it because, I mean, you've got so much to do. And, I, I mean, I feel like the uh, I've got 
a cold coming on. I can feel my, like a migraine headache. So I'm going to be working with short staff, a new computer system. You're going to have your hands tied, and I'm just, I just don't know how I'm going to make it. I'm so sorry about your migraines. I did forget that I was um, diagnosed with walking pneumonia today. So in, in fact, I was just about to go ask the practice manager if I could go home. So I'm just smiling and laughing because that was a pretty good one, Shirley. I'm going <laughs> to concede this this one of one downmanship to you. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, perhaps those listening can envision other ways of who could be the sickest or the mm. most overburdened with with the job, and um, on and on it goes. And that probably seems familiar to some folks. Um, we've heard some of those conversations in our day-to-day -day work, no doubt. So now let's go on to a little more complicated one. But if this is called the status slide, and we start off with a high-low status, and then we're going to shift um, as we as the dialogue goes on and I think that this will help show how a shift in status can make a difference in the relationship, the therapeutic relationship. So Shirley's going to be the physician and I'm going to be the patient. Okay. And, <clears throat> and I'll just make my own internal judgment call about when I'm going to do the little cue to switch, but um, I think you'll pick up on it, Shirley, and I think listeners will too. Okay. And then you that will be your cue to bring your status down a little bit, and I'll try to bring mine up just a bit. Got it. Okay. Oh, uh, all right. Um, oh, Dr. Dudley, uh, I'm sorry to take up your time. I, I just know that you're so busy, but I, I, I really... Uh, I need some help. I'm just really frustrated. Well, well, Beth, you have an appointment, and so you've got my time right now, and I'm I'm here for you, and got the answers. Just tell me what's going on, and we'll get you feeling better. Well, I'm really sorry. I feel like maybe, maybe I shouldn't have made. I just I feel like oh, I just don't. I'm just taking up way too much of your time. I'm just. I'm really sorry. I just. I wish I, I wish it was easier for me to. I, I just. I'm just really so sorry to take up your time. I'm just anxious. I just, yeah. Well, well, Beth, your your anxiety is it's it's important to me. I'm here. I've got the knowledge, and and I'm I'm ready to help you. We just uh, tell me what's going on, and I'll I'll be happy to figure figure it out so you can be feeling better by uh, as soon as possible. Oh, you know, I I do. I feel like your knowledge is so important. Um, Dr. Dudley, I, you know, I, I've got my own, I just finished my doctoral thesis, and I feel like, you know, now I, I have my PhD. I can, can't really actually believe it. Well, Beth, that's something to be proud of. That's a, that's a lot of education, and, a, and, and that's a lot of knowledge. And just spend some time with me today. Let's let's figure this out. If you can, um, if you can maybe give me some examples of of uh, when you're feeling anxiety and and give me some of those times. Oh, that's yes. I, I, I just last evening I was with uh, my husband at a restaurant and I was feeling okay until the waiter came up and he said there was some change in the menu and I don't know why I just got anxious it became hard for me to think at that point <clears throat> Beth that's that's a very good example um, thank you for sharing so you felt anxiety when you knew there would be a change and possibly what you were going to eat or what the evening was going to be um, what the evening was going to be like so is there another example you can give me um, yes I'm going to stop our, our dialogue, but um, I, I think, and I'll ask you, Shirley, for your input. It just it felt like there was a point where I could be safer mm -hmm. with you, mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it was around the knowledge PhD. Um, it felt like some of the confidence that you had 
inserted in the beginning came down just a little bit. Not yes. a huge amount. Mm -hmm. You were still there, but it felt like you were listening and with me in a different way. Did you have, sense any of that? Um, yes, and <clears throat> although I haven't been to medical school, I've worked with a lot of doctors and understand that, that they are taught to exude that that level of confidence. And, and in, in a, most situations, that's very, very helpful to the patient. But in this situation, me exuding confidence and knowledge and I can figure this out wasn't working with you. And um, when you started it, it, um, exerting yourself or being a little bit more confident, that's when I changed. And it, it seemed to help you and get you to um, come a little bit out of your shell and tell me about your anxiety. So I did feel the shift um, when I started hesitating more and, and talking slower. That's really wonderful feedback. And from a teaching standpoint, what I can say is that I initiate it because I'm in, in this teaching role, so I initiated that change, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be the teacher. You could you could do that in your practice, um, and any any listeners could as they become aware of you know what their status is and maybe how they might want to shift it to, to be helpful to somebody else and vice versa. I think that's fantastic for our listening doctors because that's just another tool in their toolbox that they can use to communicate with their patient or or even with. Um, their nurse or assistant to be able to to help the person to change their approach a little bit. That's great, Shirley. I, I, and I think that's really kind of what excites me about all of this process. And I can say that nurses, too, it's like if, if you're feeling at a lower status, and I think I might have mentioned this earlier, but if you're feeling at a lower status but you have something important to bring forward, take a deep breath and change your body posture and that can help you um, raise your status and bring more confidence out in what you're saying and that's really important too so so I'm going to um, just show this next slide and thank you very much for helping do that it makes it a fun way to learn oh, well yes it's not only fun but I know that in the coming weeks that that I'll be even more aware of um, ways th the, that I can use status better or nonverbal in communicating well that's great feedback and um, I, I, I think that's very true this in this moment we can have fun with it and um, just get in, introduced to the the ideas but as we internalize it and reflect on it and have different experiences in our life that give us different choices about what we're going to do in any particular moment. We can apply this stuff forever. So it's very valuable in that way. Hmm. Um, so in, in debriefing terms, and we've done a little bit as we've gone along. I think it's worth just having a, a slide to sit with any of the these activities we can bring in. Um, input from the people that participated or the people that may have watched and um, what did you notice people listening might have noticed different things in the tone that we were using as we went up or down with our status um, to notice also if there's one status that you feel more comfortable in um, and that's just interesting information to mm -hmm. have um, one might be more natural um, and the other might be a little bit more challenging to develop, uh, but it's good to practice. It's good to be aware of, um, even to know what it feels like to be in the opposite status. If you're comfortable with high, um, and you get a chance to play an activity where you and where you're a low status, then what a great way to build empathy. Um, and also to just ask, what ideas do you have? People listening probably have some really good ideas that you and I might not even think of. Absolutely. So, 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 so that's um, a good, I think, picture of using medical improv to teach uh, high and low status as they pertain to healthcare and um, our relationships with our peers and our relationships with our um, our leaders and um, also our patients. I'm going to end with a more a humorous. Um, video. It's six minutes. I'll tell you up front. I'm going to give you a little bit of information about it so people that are only listening um, can can also enjoy it. But the, the link is on in the resources and on the slide. 
and this video is, is of a an acting class where two young men are participating in an improv activity called Master Servant. So there's obviously a lot of high and low status um, in, in this um, relationship. And you will see them, this, it starts out with one of the, the master who is lying on the couch and his servant whose name is Cecil and he's in a wheelchair and um, you'll hear off to the side some coaching um, by Keith Johnstone and he's the one that gave the quote earlier in the slideshow and he's helping them like try different things and it's a good way to see how how an activity can unfold in a medical improv workshop with somebody that's facilitating and coaching um, things along. So are you, are you ready to watch this? Basically, it's also pretty funny and absurd about, it's like the extreme um, polarity of high and low status in the human species. So are you sounds, ready to watch that? Yes, it sounds great. Oh. Such a lovely afternoon, eh, Cecil? Indeed, sir. Indeed. Sun's a bit bright, however. Would you mind switching me around to this end of the couch? Please, Cecil. No problem, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir? Can you hand me my balloon? <laughs> of course, sir. <laughs> You're being a bit slow. <laughs> Complain, tell him. Cecil, you're moving very slowly. <laughs> Sorry, sir. Can you hand me the balloon, Cecil? Yes, you're all, sir. Thank you. So for God's sake, do I have to lie here all day? Do I have to lie here all day? Stand up. Please, Cecil. Go back. Go back. Of course, sir. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry, sir. I'm very sorry. Run! Yes, sir? Why are you moving the pillows before you move me? <laughs> are the pillows more important than me? No, sir. <laughs> no, absolutely no, sir. I'm, I'm just, uh, I was here just... Sorry, sir. Go lie down again. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Cecil, this is very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop, sir. I'll continue. Watch my feet. <laughs> the master is a nice person. He doesn't want to get angry. Cecil. But you do. <laughs> oh, thank you, Cecil. You're very gentle today. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. Don't help him. Cecil, I don't want to hit you, but sometimes he's worth my hand. I'm not sure. for a second? 
You may suffer. He may just be your son of the God. No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> what are you thinking? I'm very sorry, sir. I'm very sorry, sir. I'm on the couch. <laughs> so I'm still not on the couch. I'm on the floor. I'm on the floor. Where did somebody arrive? Where did someone come? What did they think of me? Uh, um, they will. <laughs> <laughs> they think you will not be, sir, and I, I'm, a, I'm a bad servant. It's, it's, it's not without truth, this scene. Our first visit of the scene. It's about the interest of this earth. So, can you hear me, Shirley? Yes, I can hear you now. <clears throat> okay. So. I can hear the echo again. We edit. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Oh, wait. I've got you I muted. Oh, okay. yeah. And you, to... there you go. Okay. So um, that's kind of a, a funny way to look at something serious, and we don't typically get quite that physical or crazy in the classes that I teach. But um, I hope that you enjoyed it, and I think that. Um, if you wanted to have some further conversations about what you noticed in that um, scene about high and low status and how you might bring that into a therapeutic scene or a therapeutic setting and um, bring your best self forward. So that's um, all I have for today except welcome to the magic of, of medical improv. I appreciate your time. Well, Beth, thank you again for, for sharing your knowledge, and we'll encourage people to go to NAIMP.org NAIMP to see the slides and also listen to your first presentation where you go in detail about medical improv. And then also um, you want to go to the slides on the website so that you can see all of Beth's resources. And if you'd like to get in touch with her, you would go to Beth at Beth Boyton. Is it Beth Boyton dot com? Yep. Um, no, it's confidentvoices.com, although oh. the other one will take you there, too. So. Okay, so if you go back to the second slide, um, okay, Beth, so Beth at confidentvoices.com is the best way to reach you. Okay, and we encourage people to go and, and review the slides and also see the resources. So thank you, Beth, very much, and thank you, listeners. We look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you.